I'd like to welcome back to the stage. We have Roddy Spear, our international president elect of Toastmasters. And also we have Aaron Beverly, who was a world championship of public speaking in 2019. So to get started, um, Roddy, you're going to be the president next year. I'm curious why or when did you decide to take on this journey? It was not planned. <laughs> I, I realized that as a club officer, my domain of influence was my club. And then when I was area director, I could you know, help out with my four clubs. And so as I went up the ranks and as a district leader, it was just my district. And then it occurred to me, oh, you know, the higher up you go, the more influence you have. And then, you know, the board of directors sets policies and sets the protocol. So I thought, why not? So, but yeah. there were stops and starts. It's not like I continued all the way. <laughs> it took me a while to decide to run, so. Yeah, definitely. It wasn't like something when you first got into Toastmasters, no. you were like, I want to be the president. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that's probably a rare occasion. Yeah. So, and then for Aaron, um, you, con you participated in the contest in 2012 and you got second place. And then in 2019, you got first place. I was reading about like how so, you... 2016. 2016, it's sorry. Second place. 2016, yeah. second place. And then 2019. Uh, why did you get into competing in the first place? I originally heard about the world championship of public speaking and a world champion of public speaking when I gave my icebreaker speech in 2009. I gave the speech, I literally practiced my icebreaker speech for 24 hours straight because I did not want to mess it up. I was completely terrified of giving this speech. And after I gave that speech, a gentleman, the Toastmaster of the day, he got up and he said, there is a future world champion of public speaking. And it took me a few years to build up the courage to actually participate in my first contest. And one of the people who really inspired me to do so was the second place winner in 2011 and 2014 and third place in 2019, Kwong Yu Yang. He, his speech, fortune cookie I just thought was so amazing I thought he was so natural on stage and I said I can do that and I'm going to try to do that next year I'm going to be the 2012 world champion of public speaking <laughs> and then I play second in area <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I got started <laughs> okay so you got started because somebody commented on your icebreaker and they're like they, they saw it in you and then and then seeing other people doing it you, you knew you could do it too yep. Eventually. Okay. Eventually, yes. But you got there. Even after, you know, the first time and you knew you could do again first place. That's awesome. I was reading about um, how you got into Toastmasters because of a, a bad experience on stage, uh, like forgetting your lines mm -hmm. in college. And then you mentioned yesterday that you also had experience at giving a toast at your father's celebration and being silent on stage. Um, and I'm wondering, maybe you could debate between the two of you, <laughs> is it necessary to have failure to push you forward to do hmm. something in your life? I like that question, and the thought that immediately comes to mind, even though I wouldn't say that it's a rock bottom, but a rock, your rock bottom is, or rock bottom is not the catalyst for your greatness, or that's probably a paraphrase, but I love that quote, that's what I wrote down. And I don't necessarily think that you need that to jumpstart you. It could just be because of a personal need. You feel that you're missing something and you want to plug in the gaps, if you will. And that's how I initially joined Toastmasters. I joined Toastmasters because in 2009, it was the Great Recession. I was a senior in college. All of the job opportunities that I thought I was going to have were evaporating left and right. I needed to find a way to stand out amongst the other applicants that were applying for all of these jobs. And 
I was introduced to Toastmasters by my first mentor, former president, uh, Dilip Abe Sekra in 2005, 2006. And I didn't join Toastmasters until two years after that, I learned about it. But it was because I felt that I had a gap and I needed to find a way to plug that gap. I needed to find a way to stand out. That was why I initially joined Toastmasters. But the occasion that you were referencing where I forgot my lines, that definitely was a, another piece of inspiration, but further back in mind. Got it. Uh, I agree. I don't think you need failure necessarily, but that does propel you. I want to say in my speech yesterday, I did say that after I, I failed to, I mean, all I could get was one sentence for my dad's celebration, and my sister said, you need Toastmasters. It's not that I immediately joined Toastmasters. The thought was there. And I mentioned this to some of the Toastmasters yesterday. I had started my first job. And perhaps this is cultural, I don't know, but I thought I was showing respect. I used to be quiet in meetings because I thought I was the new kid on the block. I've just come from India, I got my master's, so how much experience do I have? So I'd sit quietly in meetings, listening to everyone, until my boss called me aside and he said, do you understand what's going on? <laughs> well, yeah, I do. He's like, then you don't say anything. And I thought I was showing respect, but that was not how it was perceived. So when they started a club, and by the way, it's easier said than done. Just because someone says speak up doesn't mean you can start speaking up. And that's the story of my life as a kid in Africa that my teacher told me to speak up. And then in India, they made fun of my accent. And then I've come to the US. So when they started a club in my office, which was so fortunate for me, I joined. And like most people, it's the best kept secret. I wish I joined it sooner. <laughs> that's what everyone says. And I, I do agree with that. But I was lucky that they started the club and I joined. Yeah. When you had that criticism, that was in the US yes. here, that they were like, you need to speak up. Yes. Um, would you consider yourself an introvert? I actually <laughs> never thought about it. <laughs> uh, because, it, you know, like it depends on the circumstances. So when I'm with my family, they tell me definitely you're not an introvert. But, <laughs> but then when I'm outside with friends, I'm quiet. So I, I guess I'm mixed. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so Aaron yesterday was talking about introverts and extroverts, and um, I've read the book by Susan Cain, Quiet, and she talks about like the cultural differences. <coughs> We're here in the U.S. We encourage everyone. We prioritize extroverts or extroversion, and that's seen as like confidence and seen as uh, competence, basically. Mm -hmm. But she points out that in, in Asian cultures, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And the Bay Area, she points out as an example of like where Asian culture predominates <laughs> and introversion is actually more of a prized quality here. But would you say that you've had to fight like some of your background? Uh, yes. Going, yeah. Yes, I, I feel I had to overcome it. And also engineering is quite a uh, male dominated field. So I would be sitting in meetings thinking that's wrong, that's wrong. But I didn't have the courage to speak up or even the way to say it nicely, like you finally learn in Toastmasters when you give the evaluation. So that really helped me learn to speak up. And now I have no issues at all. I, I can give feedback. I can speak up in meetings. So I see the value in Toastmasters. I want more people to benefit from it. And that's one of the reasons that propelled me. I also feel that our leadership should reflect our membership. And now we are growing more and more overseas. And I feel more and more people should step up. And, and I've g gotten really nice feedback as I ran for elections. I tell you, it's very interesting. I think only in Toastmasters could you have a global election, right? I have to campaign around the world. So I speak to people from everywhere. And one message that I got a lot was when they would see me, they'd be like pleasantly surprised. One question I would get is, Oh, so where are you on the Zoom call? And then I would say, New Jersey. And they're, oh, because they always assumed I was speaking to them from India or somewhere. But they thought it was a nice, I mean, that's the impression I got that, oh, there's a minority, there's someone else who's running. And so that made me feel good because we need to see someone like ourselves. And then you think, oh, I can do it too. She did it, so why not me? And so that also spurred me on to try. And as I mentioned to Aaron and Sylvia yesterday, the first time I ran for second vice president, I did my best. Like in the swimming story, I learned my lesson. I said I was going to do it. I did my best, and I lost. 
And so I thanked my team, I thanked everyone. I said, that's it, I tried, done, you know? And my husband said, look, there's COVID. What are you gonna do? We can't travel, we can't do anything. You love this organization, you've given it your best, you lost, you know how it feels. Worst case, you lose again, best case you win, so try. So I tried a second time and I was successful. So I was lucky I had someone to push me, but here we have Toastmasters to push us succeed. So that was a good for me. For sure. In your bio, I saw that um, you volunteer in groups at your work for women at AT&T yeah. and then also inspiration yeah. for Asians. Yes. So for, with minority groups, do you feel like there's certain like upbringing or beliefs that hold them back from taking on leadership positions? Well, my, my mother was a big influence in my life. I only have sisters. And Sylvia, I'm in the opposite situation. I'm the youngest of five. <laughs> and, uh, I only have sisters. There was no discrimination in my household. But my mom always said, you have to be self-sufficient, independent, speak up, all this while I was growing up. And so when I came to the US and I said I was the only girl in my engineering class, I was a bit shocked. And then I, in my dorm, I would tutor whoever I met in the elevator or whatever with their math. And they were like, oh, girls aren't good at maths. And I'm like, says who? Why? I mean, I don't know why we have this feeling here in the, the US. Because luckily, we didn't have that in India. Nobody ever said only boys are good at this and girls are good at that. So I, I suddenly was facing that. And, and so I thought, you know, I'm going to try and speak up and help. And it's, it's, it's all a mindset. You know, people are fully capable of doing stuff. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. I like that stereotype. <laughs> the girls are good at math. Yeah. How about you, Erin? Have you do you have any opinion about minorities or uh, having something that holds them back from taking on leadership positions? So I do think it depends on the culture. It depends on the background. Speaking for myself, uh, African American, and growing up with a single mother, I was also told like you have to speak up, you have to stand up for yourself because basically the world, the society that we live in is going to try to knock you down. So you have to make sure that you are strong enough to fight against it. So I am an introvert, as I talked about before, and I used to use that introversion as an excuse to not do that. I was always afraid to stand out in the crowd. I was always afraid to even stand up for myself I didn't really understand my mother's lessons until I found something where, okay, I really do need to speak up and stand up. And that was when I got to college and started speaking in different groups. So I think it's really important to do that, but it's, for me, it was more so of a necessity to just survive as a person in this world that we're living in. I didn't really put a real, a real cultural thing around it until I got older and really could understand what my mother was trying to teach me and why. But she always tried to ingrain it in me. And finally, the lesson started to take. <laughs> okay, it sounds like you had to kind of fight your natural introverted tendencies to, to follow what she was teaching you. Exactly. Okay. You say you're introverted and that you're very quiet, but I don't think you're soft spoken. <laughs> <laughs> you actually you actually have a very loud or you I can hear you in the back of the room. I was sitting in the back and I could hear you. <laughs> yeah, I was saying before that I actually don't need a mic, but I, I use it just to be a person that practices what he preaches. <laughs> Do you think a soft spoken person can be a leader or lead the room? Absolutely. And I think a lot of times we always they say the squeaky wheel gets the oil and in organizations and corporate environments and no matter where you are, you will always have somebody that is the loudest voice in the room, the squeaky wheel. And sometimes they are legitimate. Sometimes they know what they're talking about. And a lot of times they're full of crap, <laughs> but it's the people who I feel sit and listen <coughs> and can try to internalize things, try to empathize with different people, and not dominate the conversation, but 
really think about how they can facilitate or navigate uh, again another lesson from sylvia thank you mm -hmm. it's i think it's those people who can really lead us to the next level because it's not about them being heard it's not a, a ego thing it's not pride it's really about understanding and trying to make things better so yeah i think it's those who can sit and reflect and are more soft-spoken that can really be strong leaders. You don't have to be the loudest voice in the room to be a strong leader. Yeah, I agree with that. There's like a saying in like Eastern culture that the sage is silent. That's the smart person in the room. Do you have an example of a leader that you admire who maybe exhibits these qualities? Who exhibits those qualities? So for me, in my career, there have been many people that have helped me along the way. And right now, the person that I work with in Deloitte, his name is Bob. And I would say out of the two years that I've worked with Bob, he has probably been more influential in my career than any leader in the previous 12 years of my career. He is a person who really sat and tried to understand what my skill sets were and how they could benefit the team and how I could position myself to take the skills that I do have and just run with those and not necessarily try to learn all of these new skills that or the, the latest new craze that we're trying to teach everybody. It was always for him, what is the best skill set that you have? And it really is, he's not always the loudest person in the room. He really likes to focus on the junior staff. And it really goes to show you when he's about to retire and so many people are just coming out of the woodworks because they appreciate how great of a leader he is. So I, I wouldn't say that he's soft-spoken, but he's not always the loudest person in the room. And he's another one that will sit and reflect and think about where his people can be most influential. Okay, yeah, I like that. Not the loudest in the room, but he leads. Roddy, do you have a leader that you admire and what are the qualities of this person? Well, like table topics, I'll, I'll change the question slightly. I, I was asked many questions during the Women's Day month and in our Toastmasters magazine, they wrote an article about us because now we have three women leaders coming up in Toastmasters. And I think I was very fortunate as a child, not that I paid any attention to politics or anything, but as a child, Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister of India. So for me, a woman being a leader was, uh, you know, nothing. Uh, that's what I saw as a kid. And, you know, my mom was such a, a proponent of women's rights and women's issues and always telling us that we had to do it. So, so it kind of influenced me. So I have to say, when I had two daughters, I didn't want to... Uh, explicitly say anything to them, but I only picked women doctors. So when they went for <laughs> visits, they only saw women as professionals, women, you know, so I always tried that. And I remember I, I always go to the gym regularly. And when they were kids, like typical parents, I'm like, no TV during the school week. And all, I had all these instructions. I'd come back from the gym and my husband and my two daughters would be watching TV. <laughs> and I'd say, how many times have I told you no TV during the school week? And he'd say, oh, you left me. You left me and you went to the gym. What do you want me to do? So I said, can you please put on a show where women are the main characters if you insist on watching TV? So a few weeks later, I go to the gym, I come back, and guess what my husband's watching with my kids? Xena, Warrior Princess. <laughs> It, it was not what I had in mind, but he's like, you told me, you told me. And so I had to let it go, but if you fast forward a few years, my daughter was in middle school and she had Greek mythology and there was a test. And she was the only one who aced it. And the kids were complaining like, oh, this was not covered in class. And they're like, well, Sharon Spear got an A, like Sharon. And she's like, oh, do your parents help you with that? And she's like, kind of. <laughs> and it turns out she had got the answer from Xena Warrior Princess. And my younger daughter said, 
oh, I didn't know I had to pay attention. I, I was just watching the show. <laughs> but, you know, it kind of worked out. But I love that. I think that's brilliant to surround your kids with the leaders that show them examples of what they could be, yeah. especially yeah, for women. You don't get to see that um, in all cultures. So it's, it's great that you did that on purpose. <laughs> um, you mentioned that Make sure that they hold the microphone so oh yeah maybe uh, angle it like okay like this. all right angle sure. yeah sorry a little <laughs> bit better to optimize okay. the sound you mentioned um that you were the only female in your engineering classes mm -hmm. in college or in your masters mm -hmm. and then you were the only african-american at that that wedding you talked about at your world championship speech do you think there's an advantage of being the only one or the odd one out sometimes I think it can be beneficial to be the only one as long as you're not terribly uncomfortable being the only one. Like if people are going out of their way to make you uncomfortable because you're the only one, then I think that's where you have a problem. But if you you are the only one, I find that that's a great opportunity to find a good story as I demonstrated with that lesson with the with the shoes. I think that if you are the only one, one thing that you can do, and I just believe that this is something that we all need to do, period, is just appreciate the culture that you are in. So don't try to think about it in your culture. Don't try to change it to something that's more familiar to you. Appreciate it for what it is, especially if you're being embraced by the people you're around. Now, if you're not being embraced by the people you're around, and I think we all have stories about situations like that, that's where I think it's time to start fighting against it. So, and the ways that you can fight against it, there are so many ways that you can do that, but I, I do think it's advantageous if you are being embraced, and I think it's advantageous if you are even, uh, if people are not embracing you, if people are trying to make you uncomfortable, then you can fight them and say like, hey guys, this isn't right, let's change this, what you're currently doing. Uh, so it can be beneficial, even though that other situation that I talked about is a little bit harder, it can be seen as beneficial if, it can lead to something positive down the line, I feel. Sure, and Roddy? What? Yeah, I think what America has taught me, and especially Toastmasters, is they're all very accepting and um, accommodating, but sometimes it is a little uncomfortable, and sometimes, I think our founder, Dr. Smedley, said it best, that with communication comes understanding, and with understanding, we lead the way to peace. But I'm not going that the, about peace, but I think communication is the key. And sometimes um, people put two and two and, and make six and don't realize. So I, I remember the first time <laughs> I went to a restaurant. Uh, well, I'll tell you, it was Taco Bell. And, <laughs> and I ordered a, a Mexican pizza without the meat. And the guy looks at me, and then he leans closer, and he's trying to be helpful, and he said, it's the same price. <laughs> I said, thank you, thank you, but uh, I, I just am vegetarian. But I'm just, you know, so there's some funny situations that happen, but I think with, with education, because I remember even my in-laws could not fathom that there was a person who didn't eat meat. Like, what do you mean you don't eat meat? But, you know, there, there's so many differences, but over time they kind of get used to it and then they get along, so. <laughs> oh, so when you came here, not a lot of people knew about but being no. vegetarian? Is yeah, times have changed. I have to tell you, like in my office, I would explain, look, I'm vegetarian. They say, don't worry, don't worry. We'll make sure there's food for you. And then they say, look, tuna sandwiches right here for you. And I'd be like, no. <laughs> You're right. Times have changed. <laughs> yeah. We've come a long way yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of food choices. I'm sorry, I have to geek out real, really quick because when, when you said that, oh, what do you mean you don't eat meat? I, I just think of my big fat Greek wedding. <laughs> like, what do you mean he doesn't eat meat? <laughs> it's okay, I'll make lamb. <laughs> I'm sorry, that, that popped into my head, I just had to say it. <laughs> 
Okay, for Roddy, um, I wanted to know, what are your plans? Do you have big plans as president next year? Yeah, so one thing people need to understand is that even though I'm going to be international president, it's not like I'm an authoritarian and I just said, oh, wait, this is what we're going to do. Because when you join the board of directors, it's like a, a cruise ship that's sailing in a particular direction, and some people get on and some people get off. Sure, I can help uh, direct policy changes and so on, but it's only a slight change in the direction. You really can't make that much of a change. But I still think it's quite amazing. There are not that many companies that are in existence for 100 years. So I would say to all our members here of District 101, in Dr. Smedley's honor, he wanted us to improve ourselves, to learn, to grow. How about doing one more level, one more path, right? Improve yourselves, because that's what he wanted. Or get someone to join, because he wanted to spread the word. And the other thing is, you're all here in corporations, and I don't mean to make this like some kind of advertisement, but I think it's important that, you know, they do corporate matching, and they ask you to give money to good causes. The Smedley Fund is there in a lot of companies, if you go look for it, and you could donate and match it, which will help you, because once the organization gets money, we improve pathways, we improve things for our members. So there are many ways that all of us could honor Dr. Smedley and what he's done for us. And I think that's what I would like to convey to our members. Can you explain what the Smedley Fund is? So there is a fund that Toastmasters has called the Smedley Fund after Dr. Smedley. And that is money that is used. For example, we use some of the money there to uh, work on pathways, uh, so on our educational program. But it's also used to help members when there are natural disasters. Uh, for example, when there was that earthquake in Morocco and somewhere, so Toastmasters wrote to us and said, can you help us out? So sometimes we uh, help them with the dues or we send materials. And now with so many natural disasters around the world, many people appeal, ask for help. So that is a fund that is there to help fellow Toastmasters to get on their feet and then get back and continue. So. There's a lot of good from that, and people don't know about it, and especially with corporations matching funds, that would be a good place to help. Okay, nice. Yeah, I didn't know about it, so now we know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for Aaron, you mentioned your, your mentor, Dilip Ebesekara, um, yep. uh, <laughs> that he was a previous president of, uh, international president of Toastmasters. Yep. Has... Are you still in contact with him? Do you do you feel like he's continued to coach you through these years still? So I have taken his lessons throughout my entire, almost my entire speaking career. However, I am really bad at keeping in touch with people. <laughs> and unless I just make a really specific effort, it is hard for me to stay in touch. I've never been a big phone person. I only recently got into social media, and then over the last three years, I've gotten out of social media. So all that to say, yesterday, I was talking to Michael Nataro, who was, I, is, I don't think he's here today, but he was here yesterday. And I said to myself, I have to reach out to Dillip again because, or as I call him, Dr. Dillip. I have to reach out to him again because he has had such a big impact on my life by even just introducing me to Toastmasters. And I definitely need to get better at keeping in touch with him. But I will say that his lessons have stayed with me throughout. One thing that Dillip always preached is the power of the pause. It's powerful. <laughs> it's very powerful. Can I add to that? Yes, please. So Dilip Abesekara, Dr. Dilip Abesekara lives in Pennsylvania. And when I was just starting out in Toastmasters, he used to come to New York and give speeches on one of the local clubs there, and that's where I met him. And I was so impressed that a past international president would drive 200 miles to just come give a speech at a local club and go back. And he also mentored me, and I was just telling Aaron here when I ran for international director, you know, I... I had competition, there were other people running for the role, so you have to give this two-minute speech before the elections. I shared my two-minute speech with Dilip, he gave me some feedback, he tweaked it. He is there to help 
everyone. He is just an amazing person. And I cannot tell you how many people in Toastmasters have helped me. And that's how I think many of us are where we are today because of the help of others. For sure. It sounds like, yeah, he <laughs> mentored you too. So yes. he's probably influenced many people in yes. that way. Um, going back to Aaron, just to start closing up, but uh, what is some advice you would give to people out there to encourage them to compete? Maybe it's advice that Dilip gave you or some some sort of inspiration for those of us who are too shy to compete. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, compete. <laughs> 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 and there are two questions that I started asking myself if I wanted to compete. One, is there a message that I really want to share with an audience? It doesn't matter the size of the audience. It doesn't matter if it's just an audience of one. Is there a message that I really want to put out into the world? If you have, if you say yes to that question, compete. More fundamentally, if there is something public speaking wise that you want to improve upon. For instance, if you want to practice using less filler words, if you want to practice your storytelling and get better with that, if you want to practice vocal variety, et cetera, if you can answer yes, there is something that I want to improve, do that. I can't find the specific text anymore, but there was something that I came across during my competition days where it was stated that the reason the contest exists is to showcase the skills that you learn in the club. Now, through great marketing and popularity, the contest has become this big, great event, and that's perfectly fine, but we don't want to forget the purpose of the contest, which is to showcase the skills that you are learning. It's a part of the educational program. So that's how I started to view it. And I think it's when I really started to focus on making myself better and making my speeches better round after round. I stopped making it my goal to win the world championship of public speaking. And in 2019, it was the first year where I did not write in my new year's resolution, win the world champion of public championship of public speaking insert year. And that was the year that I won the world championship of public speaking. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, so yeah. if you have a message and if there's a skill you want to improve on, yeah. Can I continue yeah. on that? How many here have not taken part in a club contest or any speech contest? Wow. So I would urge you <laughs> I would urge you all to take part in the contest, not necessarily to become world champion of public speaking, but if you do, that's great. But <laughs> It will make you improve, whether you like it or not. It will force you to improve, because suddenly you're like, oh my god, I'm in a contest. I better work on this. I got to do this. And, and just to tell you a story, when I was my club president, I didn't know the rules very well. And so the area director called me and said, I have to hold a contest, and this person is just amazing, but nobody else is coming. So you have to send someone from your club so that he can progress. Otherwise, it's not fair to him. And I did not know that you could hold a contest with just one person. <laughs> so I said, oh. And so I, I asked every single person in my club, because at the club level, you can hold a contest, or you can just nominate someone to represent the club. Everyone, oh, I have a deadline. I'm busy. My Someone's coming. I'm going out of town. There's, and then I thought, you know, I'm the president. I have to lead by example. I guess I will have to take part in this contest, little knowing that I didn't have to. And it was the humorous speech contest and table topics contest. And then I thought, oh my god, I can't make a fool of myself. People are going to see me and say she was terrible. So I actually worked on it, went to the contest, and then I won the area contest. <laughs> I went up to the division level. I won the division contest. I actually went all the way up to district. And, it, it, and then it occurred to me, like, wow, if only people push themselves to take part in a contest, it makes you improve. So it's in your benefit. Please try the contest. It's good fun. And the thing I want to repeat is Toastmasters is a safe place. Nobody's going to say, oh, my god, you did terrible. It's horrible or anything like that. Everyone's trying to improve. So please. 
take advantage of all the opportunities. I know that one contestant was mad at that area director for inviting you. <laughs> uh, but I, I noticed that there were a lot of hands for people that have never competed in a contest yet. And I'm actually going to change my position on something that I consistently say, that when people compete in the, in the speech contest, nobody ever says in the first round, that, oh boy, I can't wait to lose in the first round. However, if you are a person who is definitely afraid of competing, I say compete with the expectation that I'm going to lose in the first round, but you know what? I'm going to do it. And who knows? You may win. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that. I agree. Competing without any expectations. Just do it to do it. That's the best thing. I have one more question. The last question for Roddy. Okay. Since we talked about contests, do you have any words of advice or inspiration for members out there to take on more leadership roles, whether in Toastmasters or outside? Yes. So all the skills you learn, all the skills you learn in Toastmasters, you can use in everyday life. We are all about experiential learning. We give you the opportunities and we give you the training. So first the training, then the opportunities. And the skills you learn here, you can use outside of Toastmasters. So it is a win-win. You'll have a strong club. This club is there to support you, to help you. And you use these skills outside. And as I mentioned yesterday, these are skills you can use no matter what your occupation. It's not so specific to, you know, for me, like telecommunications or voice over IP or whatever it is. It's something that everyone can use. So please take advantage of all the opportunities. You've already started in Toastmasters. So I look forward to seeing you all. Maybe we'll see them. You know, Aaron cannot take part anymore. <laughs> Once you're world champion, you're done. So don't worry. He's not competition for you. Please take part. <laughs> Yeah. But once you lead, is that also the same case? No, the, the no. leading, it, it's, I, I don't know how, you know, the one thing people tell me in Toastmasters, they don't come up to me and say, I became a better speaker, I became a better, better leader. They say Toastmasters changed my life. I don't know how many people have said that. It really helps. So sure, take up the leadership roles because that'll help you in your work, that'll help you in your company or in your being an entrepreneur or whatever you want to do. But everything we learn helps in all aspects of life. And I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roddy. Thank you so much. And Aaron. Thank you. Yeah, great to get to know you both better. And let's have one more round of applause for these two.